who is God and what is he like? Because sometimes when you read the Bible, you get the impression as if God is inconsistent. The God of the Old Testament seems to be a very harsh God. And the God of the New Testament seems to be a very loving God. And uh, it seems as if at certain times God has no patience for us. And at other times he has extreme tolerance for everybody. So there are people who then say that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. That it's not the same God. And then because when we read the Bible, we read it as one book. We are not able to properly put together. Uh, and so sometimes our faith shifts from one era to the other and we relate to God in different eras. God is the same, but his relationship with us changes. When I was a child, one of the things that fascinated me when my family would travel, um, go into another town, we take a bus and the bus would be speeding along and for me as a child in my mind it would look as if as the bus was speeding along the trees would be moving in the opposite direction you know and, and so we were I was fascinated about these running trees uh, the reality was the trees never moved the trees were fixed I was the one moving and as I moved, it appeared as if what was fixed was also moving. But what was fixed is fixed. God is fixed, but man moves. And when we move, our relationship with him changes. Then it appears as if God is changing, but he is not the one changing. We are the ones changing. God is eternal. He is the same yesterday today and forever but god is relational god is relational and when we say god was relational it means that god lives with relationship god relates god does not dwell in isolation in genesis chapter 1 verse 26 he says let us make man in our own image let us that is relationship relationship in God God is relational in himself Father Son Holy Spirit the Trinity is relational and then he made us to be related to him in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 the Bible says that we are members of the household of God the members of the household of God so in this teaching, I want you to imagine a household, a big house, a big compound, big house. And God is the man in the house. And there are different kinds of people in the house. There are servants in the house. There are children in the house. There are friends in the house. It's a big household. But each one of them has a different relationship with God. His relationship with the servant is not the same as his relationship with the friends. It's not the same as relationship with the sons. But they are all in the household. And each one of them has to understand their relationship with God in order to benefit from him. Because you may see a servant relating to God one way and think that as a son that is how you should relate. But the relationship between the father and the servant is not the same as the father and the son so imagine this household and i'm going to take you on a journey just be patient with me you'll get me at the end but be patient and follow me as i teach this when god created man he created man in his own image adam was a created child of god created child of God it's very important the different children of God Adam was a created child of God God created him from the earth 
and breathed his spirit into him and he became a living being Adam started his relationship with God as a child of God not born but created a created child of God then Eve comes along she is also a created child of God so the first relationship between God and man was a relationship between a father and his children the created children of God and the Bible gives us a picture of that relationship that it was beautiful when God created Adam he gave him so much in one moment he gave him a home to live in he gave him work to do he gave him food to eat he gave him water to drink and even gave him a wife that's a good father but something happens in Genesis chapter 3 where the devil comes and tempts Adam and Eve and they fall they sin against God and uh, when they sin against God the Bible says that God comes to them they heard the voice of the Lord talking to them or walking in the garden the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day it's a very interesting picture of God I don't know about you how many of you are parents okay now if you are parents uh, if you are a father and you are in one room and you hear a sound of breakage in another room by your child you don't go walking you don't go walking I will never forget when my my one and a half year old daughter many years ago broke a precious fragrance of mine you know one of those fragrances you save a lot of money to buy and uh, she broke it and I believe I'm a man of God and I believe I have the love of God but in those moments the relationship changes <laughs> so so when you are a parent and you hear the some plates are broken somewhere or something is falling you know your child has broken something if you are a real parent those of you who are mothers you go screaming and whilst you're going you are screaming where are you what have you done and you're trying to really murder your own child but when Adam and Eve sin God does not come running he comes walking he knows what they have done but his response is not judgment his response is redemption so he didn't come with judgment or condemnation he come with self-assessment where are you what have you done not I see you you've messed up but where are you what have you done you know and the blame game started Adam said well it's not me Eve says the devil you know pass it around God says okay well none of you is ready to accept responsibility so in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 I'm beginning really to teach from here Genesis 3 24 so the Lord so he drove out the man and he planted cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life he drove out the man he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword note that these are very important statements because they will be meaningful to you very soon it's flaming sword which turned every way so the flaming sword that's a sword of fire and it's standing every way and moving very fast around the garden so there's no way man can go back 
into the household of God. At this point, the relationship of God and man changed from a father and a son to a father and outcasts. Now, the way you treat an outcast is very different from the way you treat a son. So from here, the biblical narrative after Genesis chapter 3 is not a father and his children, but a father dealing with outcasts. People who are now cast out from his presence and who are not in direct relationship with him. They are driven from God's presence. They are denied access to God's blessing. And they are defenseless against the forces of nature. And after that, God curses the ground. Not them, but curses the ground. And curses the process of producing food. And the pain in delivering a child. But he left them uncursed. But curse the ground and curse some activities that they will participate in. But at this point, they are outcasts. Now, for you to understand how relationship changes. Somebody is a soldier, trained soldier. He's married. He loves his wife. He has a daughter, loves his daughter. To the daughter, the father is the kindest man on earth. He goes to war and to his enemy, this is the cruelest man I've ever met. He picks his gun and shoots people. Now his daughter can never imagine that this kind father can kill people. But the reason he can kill people is because they are not his children. They are outcasts. They are outcasts. They don't have his nature. They are his enemies. And by relationship, he has to get rid of them. By his relationship, he has to protect his daughter. But he's the same person. When God took man out from the garden man became an outcast and became a recipient of the wrath of god and so when you read the bible from then on it seems as if god is just doing really bad th stuff for man it ends up with noah he knocks off everybody and starts the whole process again and he's still not happy with what he starts and man goes on as outcasts now it's very important that outcasts are not the same. There are good outcasts and bad outcasts. Now why do I say that in Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve have two children. First is called Cain, second is called Abel. Cain and Abel never experienced Eden. Their life starts as outcasts. I'm sure Adam and Eve tells them, we used to be in the household and we think one day we'll go back there. They can imagine relationship with God, but they are outcasts. In the process of time, these two boys bring their offering to God. And you know how that story goes. Cain brings of the fruit of the earth. Abel brings of the fat of the land. Cain murders Abel. They are both outcasts. One is a murderer. The other is a worshiper. But they are both outcasts. Abel is not a son. He's an outcast. Cain is an outcast. But among the outcasts, there are people who have a decent life, decent attitude. And among the outcasts, there are people who are horrible. But they are all outcasts. Now, it's important to understand that because, you know, sometimes you can see a very nice human being. Good-natured, nice, but not born again. 
and we say oh how can how can god just look at such a person and punish him god doesn't punish people god treats you based on your relationship if you're an outcast whether you gave him a good offering and and you worship nicely you're still an outcast you're not in his family so there are good people who are outcasts nice decent people and then there are bad people who are outcasts but the bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god now the way i like to explain that is if there is a big valley maybe a big valley something very wide like this platform and we're supposed to jump from one end to the other and somebody starts from the end and starts running 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 but he gets to jump and he jumps only one foot and falls into the valley he has fallen short another guy starts and runs very hard and jumps five feet he's improved on the one foot but he's still falling short and a very good athlete you know trains so hard and starts running and jumps all the way right to one foot to make it and then he falls now all of them fell into the valley one tried very hard one was very good but they all fell into the valley god does not deal with us based on our effort because our effort ends up in the same way unless he provides a bridge so between cain and abel we see two types of outcasts abel the child of obedience sacrifices and gives of his best seeks for god's approval but he's still an outcast and cain bad boy still an outcast so in the human race now god has to find a way to reach man he has to find a way man cannot reach him he has to reach to man and so after the flood of noah god starts a relationship with a very unique interesting gentleman called abram later to be called abraham he's minding his own business he's an idol worshiper he's an outcast he doesn't know god uh, he's not interested in worshiping god but god decides i have to do something about the human race so i have to find a way to legitimately bring them back to the household so he finds abraham and starts communicating with this abraham now if you look at uh, genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3 now the lord god has said to abraham get out of your country i want you to note the phrase the lord god had said or the lord god said to abraham get out of your country from your family from your father's house to a land that i will show you I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Powerful statement. God is saying, Abram, I'm about to do something with you, but it's not just about you. It's about the entire human race because I want to do something with you that will affect the entire human race. In you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In chapter 13, verse 14 and 16 and the lord said to note that phrase again the lord said to abram after lord had separated from him lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are northward southward eastward and westward for all the land which you see i give to you and your descendants forever and i'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth 
your descendants are going to be numerous Abraham so God is saying to Abraham I'm going to do something with you that is going to affect the entire human race and what I do with you will produce people out of you that cannot be numbered and then after that Abraham meets a very interesting mysterious personality his name is Melchizedek of whom we have so much to say that we can't say now but this Melchizedek is an interesting person whom the Bible later says has no beginning and no end but he appears on the scene and he blesses Abraham and Abraham gives him a tithe of all very interesting so you can see from this arrangement that God is working with Abraham he starts he calls him from his father's house he tells him who his de descendants will be God allows Melchizedek to manifest and bless Abraham so Abraham is being prepared to be somebody special in God's relationship with mankind then in chapter 15 something very momentous happens to Abraham go with me to Genesis chapter 15 Genesis chapter 15 And it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless in the air of my home is Elias of Damascus. And Abraham said, Lord, look, you've given me no offspring and indeed one born in my house is my heir and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying that this one shall not be your heir but one who will come out from your own body shall be your heir then he brought him outside and said look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them and he said to them to him so shall your descendants be and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness I want you to note something which is occurring for the first and only time in the Bible after these things the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying now if you would notice when God started revealing to himself to Abraham we would hear phrases like and the Lord said to Abraham 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 and, and and it happens throughout from chapter 12 right up to chapter the end of chapter 14 in chapter 15 we find a phrase that has never been used before and that phrase is very different it didn't say and the, and the Lord said to Abraham it says and the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying there is nowhere in the bible that these sequence of words occur in later in the prophetic books ezekiel and, and so on you hear and the word of the lord came to ezekiel or the word of the lord came to jeremiah but you would never hear the phrase and the word of the lord came to jeremiah or ezekiel or anybody saying you hear the word came to them or the Lord said to them but not this sequence it happens only this time in the Bible only once now if it happens only once it must have a unique meaning so we need to understand what is happening now remember God wants to bring his people back to the household he picks on Abram not by works but by grace not because Abraham is smart or intelligent or Abraham had 
done a better sacrifice or sown a seed no abraham is just minding his business god says i think i can use you he later explains why he wants to use abraham because abraham has the ability to impart knowledge and he needs some to do something with him that abraham is going to impart to everybody as i talked about that the last time but i want you to watch it says and the word of the lord came to abraham saying the word of the lord came to abraham in a vision now it didn't say that abraham had a vision but it says the word of the lord came to abraham in a vision and spoke to abraham now what abraham saw was an entity which had never been seen ever in human history up until this time and this entity is called the word of the lord this entity called the word of the lord came to abram in a vision and spoke to abram so when abram is hearing he's not just hearing a word in a vision he is hearing from a personality called the word of the law all right now so this personality called the word of the lord appears to abram and he says something to abram now i need to break it down a little bit and then we go to analyze what he meant by what he said so the question is who is the word of the lord now john who later appeared later in time in john chapter one says in the beginning was a word and the word was with god and the word was god and he was in the beginning with god but that doesn't really explain what had happened but later on jesus christ himself answered that question in john chapter 8 from verse 40 54 to 58 jesus said if i honor myself my honor is nothing it is my father who honors me of whom you say he is your father yet you have not known him but i know him and if i say i do not know him i shall be a liar to you and i do not know him and keep his word verse 56 your father abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad and the jews said to him you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen abraham jesus said to them most assuredly i say to you before abraham was i am now what jesus is saying before i appeared this time i had appeared earlier to your father abraham when did he appear to the father abraham and the word of the lord came to abraham in a vision saying so and that is why that phrase occurs only once in the bible because it never happens again you'll never hear that sequence it never happens it never occurs the word of the lord came to abram in a vision say but what he says is very important he says to abram i am your shield now why is that important because Abraham has just conquered and he has won his battle. But he says, I am your shield. Why does Abraham need a shield? Because he's about to take Abraham back to the household. And when they get to the household, there's going to be a flaming sword. A flaming sword keeping everybody from entering the household and the word that the lord said abraham don't worry i'm taking you to the father and when i get to the father's presence i will be your shield i will cover you from the flaming sword for the first time since the fall of adam a human being 
is going back home but he's not going on his own he's going with the word of the lord as his shield it is a shadow of what will happen later you cannot that's why jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father except through me i am your shield and your exceedingly great reward abraham i'm taking you back home now abraham enters the household of god and the father establishes a relationship with him when he goes to the household of god he goes not as an outcast because now he's in but he doesn't also go as a son he goes as a friend as a friend of God Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 and 9 says but you Israel are my servant Jacob whom I've chosen descendants of Abraham my friend it's very interesting Israel you are my servant Abraham you are my friend it's a very interesting because it shows you the different relationships God is going to have with different people the rest are outcast Abraham is a friend Israel servant. the father's relationship with outcasts is different from the relationship with friend different from relationship with outcasts as servants for you Israel Abraham a uh, friend my friend in James chapter 2 from verse 22 it says do you see that faith was working together with his works talking about Abraham and by works faith was made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend Abraham has access to the father's household but he has a friend's access friends don't stay in your home forever they come in and they go out they come in they have what is called visitation rights so you would find phrases God visited God visited God visited he visits friends but he doesn't visit sons I'll talk about that tomorrow <laughs> so Abraham has visitation rights and anytime he feels like going to see the father he can go but he goes alone nobody follows him because he's a friend of God his friend his children are not friends of God his wife is not a friend of God so God talks to Abraham his wife doesn't hear what God is saying he says darling what's what is God saying well he says so and so and some she doesn't tell the wife because if God says go and sacrifice our son you don't tell your wife <laughs> 
so later on God says Abraham you know what what I'm doing for you is not just for you alone I'm relating to you but in you all families of the earth will be blessed so we have to start expanding this relationship so I'm going to give you a password or an access code and anyone who has that access code even though they are not my friends because they have Abraham's access code they can come to me so he established an access code with Abraham it was called circumcision he says I'm gonna mark you specially I'm gonna mark you and this mark I'm giving you Abraham I want you to give the same mark to ever to other people and whoever you give their mark to I will receive him so start with your sons and then start with your servants even your servants who are not Israelites if you mark them with this mark they are accepted with me because I relate to them through you they are not my friends but they are friends of my friend and because of that you can have access so this relationship remember what God is doing is expanding it he's not just relating to Abraham he's relating to the whole world but he has to start with Abraham and he starts with circumcision and begins to pass it on every child born through circumcision becomes part of the axis including the females now as this relationship develops God has to now give Abraham the full assurance that what he started is serious he's going to see through so he decides to have another covenant with Abraham Genesis chapter 15 verse 28 now when you look at the relationship with Abraham on the surface it looks like it was a covenant just with land a land God would give Abraham but the book of Hebrews says to us that Abraham really wasn't looking for a land he was looking for a city whose builder was God so it, when when you hear them talking you think it's like a land transaction but it's not a land transaction it's bigger than a land transaction because Abraham understands this relationship is not just about a land it's about a city it's about a household we must possess it's about a spiritual relationship with God we must have so Abraham although he's talking about land he sees it in the terms of a spiritual relationship a city whose builder is God all right now Abraham says to God in Genesis 20 15 verse 18 Lord God how shall I know I will inherit it how shall I know and he said to him bring me a three-year-old Haifa a three-year-old female goat a three-year-old ram a turtle dove and a young pigeon and he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other but he did not cut the birds in two and when the vultures came down on the carcasses Abraham drove them away now when the sun was going down it deeply fell upon Abraham behold horror of great darkness fell upon him and then he begins to speak to him about what was going to happen to his descendants and so and so forth and the Bible says that in verse 17 it came to pass when the sun went down it was and it was dark that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces 
and then the Lord did the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham now God says to Abraham bring a heifer a three-year-old female goat a three-year-old ram a turtle dove and a young pigeon there are three big animals two small ones so he cuts the haifa and the goat into two cuts them into two in the middle in two cuts them in two and then he lays one part on one side the other part on the other side one part on the other side the other part on the other side so if you cut three animals in two that's about six pieces so you have three rows here three rows here, and a path in the middle and then two birds one on one end not cut but one here one there so you know there are four animals all killed four on one side four on the other side and there is a middle path now what is happening abraham fully understands what is going on because this is what happened in abraham's culture abraham is a syrian and in the syrian culture this is what happens when you want to affirm a covenant or a promise to somebody normally when a major king conquers a smaller king the smaller king would do that cut these animals put them into two and the smaller king the conquered one the minor one would walk in the middle of the animals and swear to the one who has conquered him and say if i break my word let me be like these animals that have been cut in other words if i break my word my covenant with you i am dead kill me my life ends like these animals so god says to abraham i want to show you how serious i take this relationship with you and what I'm going to do through you to the rest of the human race. He says, cut down these animals. Now, Abraham is the minor and God is the superior. God is eternal. He never dies. But he now brings himself to human language and human terms. And he says, I'm going to do something to you, Abraham, to show you the seriousness of what I have committed and so when he starts this process he puts abraham to sleep he says abraham this has nothing to do with you if you don't worship me for the rest of your life i will still honor this if you fail me i will still honor this it is not a covenant with you it is a covenant between me and me god swore by himself And God in the night, in the evening when it's dark, begins to walk in the form of a flaming fire. He begins to walk in that fire, in the midst of those dead animals. And he says, I swear to you, Abraham, if I fail, I am no longer God. If I fail, I'm gone I'm dead I put eternity all creation everything that has been in created in the entire universe on all planets and galaxies everything that exists I put it at your disposal Abraham if I don't make you come back home to my household to be part of my family again I will no longer be God and he swore to him that day from that day onwards God elevated his relationship with Abraham you know we we think God hears us because we have faith 
we think God hears us because we tried hard but God says go to sleep this is not about you it's it's great for you to fast but God doesn't answer your prayer because you fasted he doesn't answer your prayer because you prayed for long he doesn't answer your prayer because of how much scripture you know he has sworn by himself it's all about him this is God on display Jehovah on display he says Abraham I'm bringing you home I'm bringing your descendants home I'm bringing the human race home as many as will believe what I have done I bring them home and whilst they remain faithless I will remain From that time on, God is saying, nothing human beings would do from today will change my mind. They can deny me. They can blaspheme against me. They can say I don't exist. They can worship whatever they want to worship. But I have said it. I will bring them home. And that was the promise he made to Abraham the day you receive Jesus Christ you think you found him he found you that is why sometimes you see people you think don't deserve should not be saved you know there are people you wish will not be saved so they will burn in hell hellfire go to the the deeper zone of hell and really burn and their fat drop you know like a kebab you know yes drop. and whilst you're burning you want to stand there and say you see now you see where you are now god is bigger than your jealousy and your anger and your discontent your anger is not God's anger your frustration is not God's frustration your hatred is not God's hatred God doesn't hate people you hate you know sometimes we pray and say God kill my enemies your enemy is somebody God wants to bring home have you noticed how sometimes your enemies prosper and you wonder what's happening because God says I have sworn you think if he goes that far to swear to Abraham he's going to depend on you to deny heaven to somebody on the basis of this relationship God begins to share his secrets with Abraham and begin to tell Abraham about future things and what would happen and how the world would turn and he begins to have this close encounter with Abraham his friend but later on through Abraham's descendants he doesn't just bring Abraham and his family he brings a nation in and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow and I'm going to talk about how we became sons and what it is to be sons of God but when he brings the seven the Abraham's folks in he doesn't bring them in as outcasts he doesn't bring them in as friends he brings them in as sons. from the book of Exodus onwards to the book of Micah Malachi is a document of God's relationship with servants not sons because all of them were servants and I'm going to show you why he brought them in as servants and how he moved us from servanthood into sonship. 
And when he makes you a son, don't desire the ways of the servant. When he makes you a son, you don't desire the way of a friend. I know we sing that song, I am a friend of God. I am. A... Ah, it's okay to sing it, but whilst you're singing, I'm a friend of God, just sing it with new understanding. It's good for us to think of God on friendly terms, but friendship is lower. Now are we the sons of God. Not servants, not friends, not outcasts, sons of God. Tonight I want you to just begin to worship the Lord. That his covenant with you is endless. That nothing can change his love for you nothing can change his desire to bless you nothing can change his purposes for your life your prayer may not be strong but God is strong your faith may not be strong but God is strong oh just begin to worship him he's a God of covenant he's a faithful God He's a God of power. He's a God of mercy. We are citizens, citizens of his household. Members of the household of faith. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Mando robo si endere robo si ki oro robo si mande le bo ze andara bo sa mozika ya da 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 bo si listen to me. God does not bless you because they are of the anointing on a man. God blesses you because of his grace and his mercy. It's not so much how anointed I am, it's how anointed he is. It's not how powerful I am, it's how powerful he is. Whatever I have, I receive from him. If I say his words, he will do in your life what he has purpose. Tonight, I want you to pull something from heaven. I want you to pull something from heaven. It is yours already, but you have to reach out and pull it. You have to pull it. You have to pull it. Something in heaven must be pulled. God is loading something into your bosom. God is pouring something into your spirit. Just pull it, just pull it, just pull it. There is power in him, in him. In him we live and move and have our being. There is power in him. There is glory in him. There is grace in him. There is goodness in him. There is favor in him. There, there is children in him. There is healing in him. There is deliverance in him. There is money in him. There is wealth in him. There, whatever you need is in him. Shut up. 